So um, there's several types of intermolecular forces we're going to talk about, and I'm going to go through them one by one in this lecture. Okay. The first one to discuss are dispersion forces, and specifically, um, we call this London dispersion forces for the gentleman Fitz London, scientist. Um, so the force between nonpolar molecules caused by the presence of temporary dipoles. And I'm going to discuss momentarily here how this temporary dipole manifests. However, the main thing to recognize with London dispersion forces, LDF, this is principally the force that exists between nonpolar molecules. That's the key word there. So when you think LDF, London dispersion forces, think nonpolar. Okay, so the London dispersion force or forces can induce something called a temporary induced dipole. And that separation of charges produced in an atom or molecule by a momentary uneven distribution of electrons. And by momentary, we're talking about teeny tiny fractions in time. So for example, let's suppose we have two H2 molecules. So here's an H2 molecule and here's an H2 molecule. And they're on a collision course with each other. So when they're really far separated, they have virtually no interactive force between the two. It's as if they don't even know that each other exists, okay? And as they get closer, as they get closer, these interactive forces become much more important. And what can happen is uh, there's electrons. So if you recall from our chapter nine discussion, I showed you this really cool simulation of an H2 molecule. And this sphere represents, um, I'll say that's the electron density. So we know that that's the hybrid orbitals, but we can basically think of this sphere as, as electron density, okay? So as this molecule A gets really close to molecule B, the electrons that are surrounding this molecule are repelled by the electrons in the neighboring molecule, all right? And because they're repelled, what ends up happening is all of the electron density moves, okay? It kind of moves out of the way. Um, much like if you go and you're about to collide with somebody walking down the street, you might kind of like move out of the way a little bit, um, unless you're like a sadomasochist and you want to like body check somebody. Anyways, so these electrons, they kind of feel the negative charge from the neighboring molecule. So they all move over to the other side of the molecule, leaving this side of the molecule partially negatively charged, which leaves the other side of the molecule partially positively charged. And then as molecule B gets closer to molecule A, that induces temporarily the same type of dipole moment. And so this is not so important in gases. However, in liquids, in non-polar liquids, right? There has to be some kind of glue holding those molecules together in the liquid phase. And it's these London dispersion forces, where as they get close to each other, they can induce these temporary dipole moments, okay? And the effect of this London dispersion force scales with the size and number of electrons of an atom or molecule. All right. So for example, we'll use boiling point as a metric for LDF. And so what that means is um, the higher the boiling point of something, the stronger is its intermolecular forces, whether it be London dispersion or another type of force we haven't discussed yet. Basically, the, the temperature at which something boils is a very good indicator of how strong its intermolecular forces are. So for example, helium boils at a whopping four Kelvin. So that means above four Kelvin, helium is a gas. You have to cool it down very, very low to four Kelvin to get it to liquefy. That means helium has very weak London dispersion forces, incredibly weak London dispersion forces. However, if we go all the way up to like xenon or radon or something like that, look at this, the boiling point is humongous, okay? 
And if you note here Z, so that's our nuclear charge, right? So that tells us how many uh, protons it has and correspondingly for a neutral atom, how many electrons it will have. Look, 54 electrons on xenon. There it is, right? 54. So this temporary induced dipole moment on xenon is quite noticeable. The fact that it boils at 165 Kelvin or even for um, radon, 211 Kelvin. And similarly, if we look at the halogens, even though these are, they're not atoms, they're molecules, but they are still nonpolar molecules. So they exhibit London dispersion forces. If you now look at what happens to these things, I mean, fluorine, 85 Kelvin. Okay, so we could say fluorine's intermolecular forces are fairly weak. But look at chlorine. I mean, 239 Kelvin. 239 Kelvin is like minus 30 Celsius. And even when you get to bromine, this is amazing. That's a boiling point that's greater than room temp. So Br2, I don't know if you knew this or not, but bromine is a liquid at room temperature. And 332 Kelvin, um, that's a really large boiling point for a nonpolar molecule. And then if you go to iodine, iodine is actually a solid at room temperature. It has such strong London dispersion forces, okay? And so again, this is all about the size of the atom. The bigger these atoms are, the more electrons, the more new, uh, protons there are, and the more uh, this temporary induced dipole moment, um, the stronger it becomes, which is basically a way of saying the bigger a nonpolar molecule is, the stronger are its London dispersion forces. Okay, so let's move forward. So now we can talk about um, London dispersion forces with a little bit more complicated molecules. So this is the series of hydrocarbons. And if I start here with butane, uh, butane is, oh, I'm going to have to think quickly on my feet, C4H10, okay? Um, pentane is C5H12. I think I did that right. Um, two, four, six. Uh, yep, I did that correctly. Hexane is C6H14. Heptane is C7H16. And of course, octane is C8H18. So we're increasing by one carbon at a time. And here I've got the, the normal boiling point. I'm going to define for you later on what we mean by the normal boiling point. Okay. Um, but if you notice here, butane, it boils at negative 0.5 degrees Celsius. So those of you, um, you smokers out there and your butane lighters, right? You notice that it is, there is liquid butane in there because it's under pressure. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go, that we can force a gas to be a liquid at high pressure. But all the same, as soon as you like release, you know, you push that little light thing, you hear the gas, pss, you hear it hiss off, right? Um, so it's gasifying as soon as you release its pressure into the atmosphere. And you notice once when you add one carbon and consequently two hydrogens at a time, it has a really significant effect on the boiling point to the point where you get to octane or heptane which even have comparable boiling points to water. I mean, octane even boils much higher than water. And so I'm going to talk about this. There's another effect that's going on there as well, which is the shape of these molecules. But as you can see here, where their molar mass is increasing, where I'm adding basically more electrons and protons, the boiling point increases. And it's due to the London dispersion force. Okay, moving on. So... Shape is very much important to dispersion forces, okay? And this is in part why you see such a huge jump in boiling point for octane and heptane, because as it turns out, these molecules are kind of like little spaghetti noodles. You know, a C8, it's, it's fairly long, and it gets long enough to the point where it can kind of like a spaghetti noodle 
tumble over other octane molecules. So if you imagine each one of my fingers is like an octane molecule, right? When it gets near other octane molecules, they can get tangled up with each other, right? And that makes them really hard to separate because once they get tangled up, their intermolecular forces are incredibly strong. In fact, stronger than water. Water boils at 100 degrees, octane boils at 126, okay? And this is also um, gives us a property that we often call greasy. So these molecules are very greasy or oily, and that has to do with their shape. The fact that they can get tangled up with each other, but now when you have another molecule on top of that, it just slides right off because something like water or another molecule doesn't necessarily want to get in there and break up that, you know, that network, that intermolecular force network. So it makes them very greasy. Okay. So if we look now at the series of C5s, so pentane is a C5, 2-methylbutane is a C5, and 2,2-dimethylpropane is a C5. So in other words, one, two, three, four, five carbons in each of these molecules, but with different bonding patterns to give us a different shape, okay? So you notice here, this molecule 2,2-dimethylpropane, uh, and by the way, you don't have to know how to name these. That will be what you do in organic chemistry, for those of you that take that class. Um, you notice here that this one is just kind of shaped more or less like a sphere, right? We can say that this carbon here in the middle, that's an sp3 carbon, so it's going to be a tetrahedral. But then look, there's other tetrahedral carbons as well. So this thing is really like, you know, it's a tetrahedral of tetrahedrals, but we can approximate its shape as a sphere, right? And now if you look at 2-methylbutane, it's almost linear, but it has one uh, branch, is what we call this. And then if you just look at uh, pentane, it's just a straight linear molecule. And now look at their boiling points. So the straight linear molecule, the, what we would call normal pentane, boils at the highest temperature because of the way it can tangle up with itself, okay? These other um, uh, isomers of pentane, uh, these other C5s, because they're like these balls, right? They, when they pack together, there's gonna be empty space, right? Much like if you imagine a jar full of M&Ms or jelly beans or something like that, right? They don't pack together with uniform efficiency. On the other hand, if you imagine like a jar of spaghetti noodles, right? They pack together really, really well. Okay, so shape is also important to dispersion forces. Even though these all basically contain the same number of carbon atoms, um, the shape can also dictate its physical properties, such as boiling point.